The third method for proving conditional statements is to use something that we've already talked about, which is a proof by contradiction. If we want to prove a conditional statement, for example the statement if p, then q, then using a proof by contradiction, we need to make the assumption that the full statement we're trying to prove is false. Remember that the negation of a conditional statement if p then q is the statement p and not q. This means that our assumption will be exactly that, p and not q, and from this we try to derive a contradiction. We can notice something interesting if we compare all three methods for proving conditional statements. In a direct proof, we assume the antecedent p and we demonstrate the consequent q. In a proof by contraposition, we assume that the consequent is false, in other words, we assume not q, and we demonstrate that the antecedent is false, in other words, we demonstrate not p. In a proof by contradiction, we assume that the full conditional statement is false, in other words, we assume p and not q. Now you'll notice that the assumption in a proof by contradiction includes both the assumptions that we would get from a direct proof and from a proof by contraposition. This means that the starting point in a proof by contradiction includes all of the information from the assumptions we would get in a direct proof and in a proof by contraposition. The downside of a proof by contradiction is that all we have is our assumption. We are left kind of directionless. We know that we have to derive a contradiction, but we don't know what contradiction we're looking for, and so all we can do is play around with our assumption until something goes horribly wrong. On the other hand, with the direct proof and the proof by contraposition method, we have a clear direction. We have a definite statement that we're trying to demonstrate. So the gains that we make using a proof by contradiction are entirely on the assumption side. We get to make both assumptions, but we lose our direction. Still, for some statements, this can be the easiest approach. Let's look at an example. Suppose we're trying to prove the statement for all x and y in the real numbers. If the product x, y is zero, then at least one of the two factors must be zero. A direct proof of this would be difficult, because given the information that x, y is zero, it can be difficult to break this apart to get information about x and y individually. We might think maybe we could multiply both sides by x inverse or y inverse, but we don't know inverses exist unless we know the numbers are non-zero, and in the case of a direct proof, we would be trying to demonstrate exactly the opposite, that x and y are zero, and so don't have inverses. In a proof by contraposition, we would get an assumption about x and y individually, which means it's a little easier to combine those by multiplication into a statement about x, y. But the problem is, the statements we get are that x and y are not zero. It tells us nothing about what they are, and so it doesn't really tell us about what the product may or may not be. On the other hand, in a proof by contradiction, we get to assume that the product x, y is zero, but that x and y individually are not. This solves our problem of having inverses for x and y, because we get to assume that x and y are not zero, which means they have inverses. Let's give this a try. Since this is a general statement about all real numbers x and y, we begin our proof in the usual way, by letting x and y be arbitrary real numbers. We then turn our attention to the conditional statement that we're trying to prove. Using a proof by contradiction, we can assume that the full conditional statement is false. In other words, we assume the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, because that's the negation of a conditional statement. So our assumption is assume x, y equals zero, but x and y are not zero. From here, we need a contradiction. Let's get a scrap piece of paper. Our assumption gives us quite a bit to work with. We have the product x, y equal to zero, and we also have that x and y individually are not zero. This means that x and y are invertible, because non-zero real numbers have inverses. And this allows us a way to split apart this equation x, y equals zero. For example, if we start with x, y equals zero, and multiply both sides by x inverse, which we can do because x is not zero, we get on the left-hand side x inverse times x, y, and on the right-hand side x inverse times zero. Since x inverse times x is one, this leaves us with y on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, since any number times zero is zero, it just leaves us with zero. We now have the equation y equals zero. But as part of our assumption, we have the equation y is not equal to zero, and this is our contradiction. Let's return to the proof. We've already made the assumption that x, y is zero, and that x is not zero, and y is not zero. We can say since x is not zero, it has an inverse, and we can multiply that inverse on both sides of our equation. This gives us x inverse times x, y equals x inverse times zero. 
We need to regroup the brackets on the left-hand side to be able to multiply x inverse by x. But of course we can do this because multiplication is associative by axiom m2. This gives us the product of x inverse and x multiplied by y is equal to x inverse times 0. Now by axiom m4, x inverse times x is 1. So we have 1 times y on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have 0 because by proposition 1, any number times 0 is 0. Finally, since 1 times y is y by axiom m3, we get the equation y equals 0. Combining this equation with the fact that y is not equal to 0 gives us our contradiction. Now, since we've reached a contradiction by assuming the negation of our full conditional statement, we're now able to conclude that that full conditional statement must be true. So we can make the conclusion, therefore, if x, y equals 0, then at least 1 of x or y must be 0. And finally, since x and y were arbitrary constants, we can conclude that this is true for all values of x and y in the real numbers. Let's look at another example. In this example, we're going to prove for all x in the real numbers, if x is positive, then so is its inverse. Since this is a general statement about all values of x in the real numbers, we begin by introducing an arbitrary constant x into our proof. Next, if we're going to use the proof by contradiction method, we assume the negation of the full conditional statement. In other words, we assume x is greater than 0, but x inverse is not greater than 0. In other words, x inverse is less than or equal to 0. To look for a contradiction, let's get out a piece of scrap paper. The one thing we know about inverses comes from axiom m4. Recall that axiom m4 says if you multiply a real number by its inverse, you get 1. And since we have not yet proven anything about inverses, this is all we know about the number x inverse. And so it might make sense that we should try to multiply x and x inverse using the information that we have from our assumption. Our assumption tells us that x is greater than 0 and that x inverse is less than or equal to 0. One thing we could do is take the inequality x inverse is less than or equal to 0 and multiply on both sides by x. This would give us the inequality x inverse times x is less than or equal to 0 times x. Let's take a minute to talk about why this is justified. By saying x inverse is less than or equal to 0, we don't know whether x inverse is less than 0 or x inverse is equal to 0. We only know that one of those two things is true. And so we either have an equation where x inverse is equal to 0, or we have an inequality where x inverse is less than 0. But axiom 04 allows us to multiply inequalities on both sides by positive numbers, which means if we have an inequality, x inverse is less than 0, then we're fully justified in multiplying both sides by x because x is a positive number. On the other hand, if what we have is an equation, x inverse is equal to 0, we're also justified in multiplying both sides by x, because we can multiply both sides of an equation by whatever we want. And so starting with the inequality that says x inverse is less than or equal to 0, we're justified in multiplying both sides by x, regardless of whether x inverse is less than 0 or x inverse is equal to 0. Now with the inequality x inverse times x is less than or equal to 0 times x, we get on the left hand side the number 1, and on the right hand side the number 0. This gives us the inequality 1 is less than or equal to 0. However, we know that 0 is less than 1, and from trichotomy we can only have one relationship between 0 and 1. Since 0 is less than 1, 0 cannot be greater than 1 and it cannot be equal to 1. This means that the inequality 0 is less than 1 is a direct contradiction to the inequality 1 is less than or equal to 0. With this contradiction, let's return to our proof. We've already made the assumption that x is greater than 0 and x inverse is less than or equal to 0. We can then take the inequality x inverse is less than or equal to 0 and multiply on both sides by x. This gives us on the left hand side x inverse times x and on the right hand side 0 times x. By axiom m4 we know that x inverse times x is 1 and by proposition 1 we know that 0 times x is 0. We now have the inequality 1 is less than or equal to 0, which contradicts what we already know, that 0 is less than 1. Since we found a contradiction to the assumption that our conditional statement was false, we can now conclude that our conditional statement is true. In other words, we can say if x is greater than 0, then x inverse is also greater than 0. Finally, since x was an arbitrary constant, we can conclude that this is true for all values of x.